In the early 2000s, the McLaren Formula 1 team invented something that made their car a quarter of a second faster overnight. They kept it secret for years, and when it finally leaked, every team copied it within months. But the strangest part is that NASA copied it too. It's now on spacecraft. This unusual device and many other technologies tells a story no one talks about. The story of how Formula 1 became the most advanced engineering lab on Earth and how NASA realized they should be paying attention. But to understand why NASA would copy a racing team, you need to understand just how extreme F1 engineering departments really are. In February 2015, Daniel Kvyat pulled out of the Red Bull garage at pre-season testing in Jerez. On his installation lap, he adjusts something on the steering wheel when he lightly clips the barrier. The new front wing is completely destroyed, and it's the only one the team have. It's the first test of the season, and with such tight timelines, the team simply haven't got another one. These first tests are so important, and with no front wing, it's a complete disaster. So Red Bull does the only thing they can. They send the car out without the wing. Obviously, Kvyat can't go quickly. The car is almost undrivable, but he manages 18 laps of system checks to make sure the car is okay. Meanwhile, back in Milton Keynes, the factory starts building a replacement. By the next morning, less than 24 hours later, a new wing has been manufactured, flown to Spain, and the car is back out on track. Now, remember, these wings are incredibly complex to put together, and that's not normal high-tech manufacturing or engineering. At NASA, redesign and manufacture takes months, sometimes years. In F1, it takes hours. And it's not just speed. F1 teams spend a quarter of a million euros just to save a single kilogram of weight. That's 150 times more than it costs to launch that kilogram into orbit. F1 is the most extreme engineering environment on Earth. So when I started looking at where all this technology came from, I expected to find aerospace. And at first, I did. The first thing I found was carbon fiber. And the story starts in an unexpected place. The same company that built carbon casings for nuclear missiles helped build the first carbon fiber Formula One car. In 1981, F1 chassis were made the same way they'd been for 20 years. Riveted aluminium sheets folded over honeycomb cores. It worked, but it had limits. McLaren designer John Barnard wanted something better. He needed a chassis that was narrower to make room for the aerodynamic tunnels underneath the car for ground effect but he needed that chassis to also be stiffer. With aluminium, you couldn't have both. Make it narrower and it becomes flexible. Make it stiffer and it starts to get heavy. Carbon fiber could solve that problem, but McLaren didn't have the capability to make it. So he made a phone call to Hercules Aerospace in Utah. The connection came through Steve Nichols, a young engineer who'd graduated from the University of Utah and worked at Hercules before joining McLaren. He knew they had autoclaves, the expertise, the materials, and so he made the introduction. And it worked. The MP41 was the first carbon fiber car to race in F1. The torsional stiffness, which is how much the chassis resists twisting, jumped from around 7,000 to 20,000 Newton meters per degree. That's nearly three times stiffer for the same weight. But the downside with carbon fiber is that you can't test it the way you test metal. It doesn't bend before it breaks. It either holds or it fails suddenly. So no one really knew how safe this car was until Monza that year. And there he is storming along in the back behind John Watson who loses it. That's John Watson and a very nasty one indeed. John Watson lost control of his car at the Lesmo corners and went into the barrier at 150 miles per hour. The impact was so violent, the engine and gearbox were completely torn off the chassis. But the carbon survival shell was intact. Watson climbed out and walked away. And this is the story everyone tells. Aerospace gave F1 carbon fiber. The technology flowed from there to the track. But that was 1981. And in the decades since, something unusual has happened. The flow has reversed. So let's return to that unusual device that McLaren kept secret for years, the one that NASA copied. In 2002, a Cambridge professor named Malcolm Smith walked into McLaren's headquarters with a device that looked like it was made from a child's toy, because it was. I recently came across this incredible interview with Malcolm himself, where he tells the whole story. 
I'll link it below, it's definitely worth watching in full. But here's the short version. Malcolm wasn't necessarily trying to make F1 cars faster, he was trying to fix a math problem. For 70 years, engineers had used three components to control vibration, springs, dampers, and masses. Springs store energy, dampers dissipate energy through resistance, masses resist acceleration, and everyone assumed that that was the complete toolkit. But Malcolm found a new way to control a Formula One car, and so he set off to build a prototype out of Meccano. And here's the trick, instead of using actual mass, Smith used a flywheel connected through gears. When you push one end, the flywheel spins. The gearing multiplies the effect dramatically. This weighs less than a kilogram. That's the mass of the device. The inertance is the constant of proportionality between the relative acceleration and the force. So overall, this device is 200 and has an inertance of 250 kilograms approximately. So just think about that. Imagine you had a 250 kilogram block of steel sitting on a frictionless table, like an air hockey puck. Push it gently and it starts moving. Keep pushing it and it speeds up. Stop pushing and it keeps going at constant velocity. Now, try to stop it suddenly. That's where you feel the resistance. Not in moving it, but in changing how fast it moves. A massive object fights the changes in velocity. And that's what the inerta does. Not through actual mass, but through a spinning flywheel connected through gears. It's a device lighter than a bag of sugar, behaving like a quarter ton block of steel. McLaren immediately saw the potential because the F1 cars have a big problem, bouncing on their tires. The wheels oscillate at around 10 to 20 times per second, and every time the tire lifts even slightly, the car loses grip. The inerta could suppress that oscillation without adding weight, but they knew if anyone found out, every team would copy it within months. So they hid it. They called it the J-damper, a meaningless name designed to sound boring and internally, they stopped using the word kilograms. I went to a meeting and suddenly found that the x-axis was zogs rather than kilograms. Zorgs, a completely made up unit. So in 2005, Kimi Raikkonen won the Spanish Grand Prix, McLaren's first victory that year. The inerta was on the car and McLaren won 10 of the next 15 races. And then nearly everything fell apart. In 2007, the biggest espionage scandal in F1 history erupted. Stolen documents, $100 million fines, and in the middle of it, a drawing of the J-damper that had leaked to Renault. Renault's engineers looked at the drawing. They saw a flywheel, and they assumed that it was a mass damper, a device that had recently been banned, and they tried to get McLaren disqualified. But they failed. The justification for the f no fine being applied to Renault is that they had fundamental misunderstandings of the nature of the device and therefore it couldn't affect the championship. The best engineers in the world looked right at it and they didn't understand what it was. But here's the link to NASA. The physics of the inerta aren't limited to cars. The same equation, force proportional to relative acceleration, works at any scale. And in space, mass is the ultimate enemy. It costs thousands of dollars to launch a single kilogram to orbit. But space telescopes need stability. Solar arrays flex. Reaction wheels create vibrations, and even nanometers of jitter can blur an image. Traditional solutions use heavy dampers, but what if you could create the effect of mass without the actual mass? Researchers began testing inerta-based isolation systems for spacecraft, the same principle McLaren used to stop tires bouncing, using geared flywheels to create phantom mass, which could isolate sensitive instruments from vibration. A device weighing a few kilograms could provide thousands of kilograms of inertance. The technology is still being developed, but the concept that Malcolm Smith sketched on paper in 1997, the concept McLaren hid under the codename J-Damper, is now being developed for spacecraft. Malcolm Smith solved a problem that engineers had missed for 70 years by understanding the fundamentals deeply enough to spot what was missing. And that kind of thinking is exactly what Brilliant helps you build. With the new year fast approaching, many people are trying to build better habits. It's the perfect time to start learning with Brilliant. Brilliant is a learning app that transformed you into a better thinker through interactive problem solving in math, science, programming, and data. 
What makes it so effective is how personalized it is. Brilliant figures out where you're starting from, then builds a learning path just for you. Lessons adjust to your pace and practice sets are tailored to help you improve faster and more confidently. One course I've been using is algorithmic thinking. And what I love is how it guides you through those satisfying moments where concepts actually click. To try Brilliant for free, head to brilliant.org forward slash drive61. Scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description. They've also given our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. All right, so the Inerta wasn't the only technology that ended up in places no one expected, but the next one has a twist. It didn't start in F1. It actually started in aerospace. F1 then made it better, and then aerospace took it back. In 1992, Nigel Mansell won the first five races of the season. The Williams FW14B wasn't just fast, it looked different. Under braking, the nose didn't dive. In the corners, the car didn't roll. It stayed flat, locked into its aerodynamic platform like it was on rails. The secret was active suspension. And the basic idea is that instead of springs and dampers, you use hydraulic actuators at each wheel. Sensors measuring everything, ride height, pitch, roll, acceleration, and a computer constantly adjusts the hydraulics to keep the car exactly where you want it. The aerodynamic benefit is massive. Downforce depends on ride height. If the car pitches forward under braking, the front wing gets closer to the ground and the rear wing rises. The floor completely changes its pitch and the aero balance completely changes. Active suspension eliminates that. The car stays in its optimal aerodynamic window, always. But here's the engineering problem. How fast do those hydraulics need to react? At 300 kilometers per hour, a car covers about 83 meters every second. If you wanna to respond to changes in the track surface or load shifts, you need valves that can cycle incredibly fast. So Williams turned to Moog, a company that made servo valves for aircraft flight controls. But the standard aerospace valves were too heavy and too slow. They weighed about 185 grams and responded at about 200 Hertz. So Williams and Moog developed something new the E024 servo valve. It was half the weight at 95 grams, and it was double the bandwidth at 400 hertz. At that speed, the system could complete a full control cycle every 20 centimeters of track. So the FW14B could predict and counteract chassis movements before the driver even felt it, because the hydraulics were that fast. So the valves had got miniaturized and made lightweight for Formula One. But then they went back to space, better than before. When NASA landed the Perseverance rover on Mars in 2021, the Skycrane descent stage had to hover perfectly stable while lowering the rover on cables. And the throttle valves controlling those engines, well, they were descendants of the technology Moog developed for Williams. And there's a robot called HiQ, built for search and rescue, that uses the exact same E024 valve in its legs. The same reflexes that kept Mantle's car flat through maggots and beckets now helps a robot walk over rubble. Now, all we've done is spoken about hardware, but what about software and data? Because F1 didn't just give NASA hardware, they also gave them a new way to see. By the early 1990s, McLaren had built something called ATLAS, the Advanced Telemetry Linked Acquisition System. It let engineers drag and drop live data displays, overlay comparisons, and build custom dashboards on the fly. But NASA's mission control was still using systems designed decades earlier. Green text on black screens. Rows of numbers that flight controllers had to mentally piece together. Now, a Formula 1 car generates about 1.1 million data points per second. From around 300 sensors streaming everything from tyre temperature to brake pressure. And all of it is processed instantly, displayed visually and updated in real time. But the real breakthrough wasn't just collecting data, it was what they did with it. F1 teams built what's called a digital twin, a complete simulation of the car that runs in parallel with the real one. This synthetic twin is fed live telemetry, constantly updating to match reality. And during a race, it runs 300,000 simulations per second, answering questions like, if the safety car comes out now, should we pit? Obviously, it doesn't always work. The twin should answer that in milliseconds, and it should test every scenario before the team has to commit. 
Now, NASA's old systems couldn't do that. If a flight controller joined a shift mid-mission, the system had to replay hours of data just to catch them up. And F1 had solved that problem years ago. So when NASA rebuilt their mission control software in the 2010s, they didn't start from scratch. They looked at what F1 had been doing for 20 years. But there's one more piece of F1 technology that's heading into orbit. In 2009, Williams developed a new kind of energy storage for Formula One. It actually never raced. The packaging was wrong for Formula One, but that same technology went on to win Le Mans three times, and it now powers London's buses and it's being developed for satellites. Here's the basic idea. Instead of storing energy chemically, like a battery, you store it mechanically. You spin a wheel. The faster it spins, the more energy it holds. When you need the power back, you let the wheel slow down and harvest the rotation. Williams actually licensed the core technology from a company called Urenco, the same company that builds centrifuges for uranium enrichment. As it turns out, the engineering problem is almost identical. Spin something incredibly fast for a very long time without it tearing itself apart. The Williams flywheel could spin at over 60,000 RPM, and unlike a battery, it didn't degrade. You could charge and discharge it a million times without it losing capacity. And even though this technology didn't actually make its way to race in Formula 1, Audi put the Williams flywheel in the R18 e-tron Quattro and won Le Mans in 2012, 13 and 14. And then the space industry noticed. A satellite in low Earth orbit crosses into shadow 16 times a day. That's 16 charge and discharge cycles every day for 15 years, nearly 90,000 cycles in total. And batteries, well, they hate that. They degrade, they lose capacity, and they eventually fail. But flywheels don't. And it's not just the software and hardware that's transferred from F1 to space. It's a way of thinking. An F1 car is never finished. It changes every two weeks. Teams bring updates to almost every race. New wings, new floors, new suspension geometries. There's thousands of changes over a single season. And this forces a philosophy. Design it, simulate it, build it, test it, fix it, and repeat. Don't spend years perfecting something on paper. Get it on track, see what breaks, see what works, learn and iterate. And that philosophy is now landing rockets. Lars Blackmore spent the early parts of his career working on control theory for Formula One, optimizing racing lines, managing grip, solving real-time problems with limited information. Now, he's the principal Mars landing engineer at SpaceX. The algorithms that guide a Falcon 9 booster onto a drone ship, well, they're mathematically the same as the ones to find the fastest racing line around a corner. Convex optimization, real-time control, managing uncertainty with limited fuel, or limited grip. SpaceX doesn't build rockets the way rockets used to be built. They build prototypes, they fly them, they watch them fail, and then they fix them, sometimes within weeks. Between one Starship flight and the next, they replace the entire heat shield. That's not aerospace culture, that's motorsport culture. The space industry used to move slowly because the cost of failure was too high, but F1 proves something different. If you can fail fast and learn faster, you don't just survive, you win. So F1 didn't just give aerospace a few clever devices. I think it helped them find a new way to build. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like this, then you'll love this video just here. Thank you and I'll see you next time.